As the space race becomes more competitive and congested, do we need more strength in international laws and tighter restrictions? Space law expert Tanya Massonsvan joined us now to discuss. So first of all, thank you so much for being here, Tanya. Thank you. Okay, here. so how close are we to having a Wild West situation in space? Not very close, because we have had laws in place since several decades. Actually, as soon as the space age started in 1957, the United Nations came together in 1958, one year later, and created a committee. And that committee has uh, established a number of basic rules in uh, treaties, in United Nations treaties. And we have five international treaties that govern the behavior of states in outer space. So the basic rules, we've had them in place for a number of years. But of course, the, the landscape is really changing now. And so we need to complement, supplement that and clarify some things. Because obviously, who would have thought what we are doing now in space in uh, 1958 or, or in the early 1960s? Now, how big of an issue are non-state and commercial actors when it comes to space exploration? And do we need a different uh, set of laws of, for those operating as for-profit entities? Yeah, so that is really what I try to say, the, this changing landscape. In the beginning it was one state that built a rocket and that built a satellite and that launched a satellite. So everything was connected to one state. Nowadays we have many, many more states that are becoming spacefaring nations. Uh, we have states that are becoming emergence, emerging spacefaring nations that have the ambition uh, to have their own satellite and so on. Uh, and we have private entities, as you say, we have uh, private actors now who actually play a major role because the majority of satellites operating in orbit nowadays are owned by one company. And so that is a big change in the landscape which also has to be reflected in the legal framework which is initially completely directed at states and now has to also take into account companies. How can we regulate the space debris given the congestion that already exists and make sure we are protecting the satellites that citizens around the globe rely on for daily communication and support? So the laws are not very clear. Uh, everything that the treaties say is mostly voluntary in the sense that we should try to avoid harmful interference and harmful contamination. Uh, but it only obliges states to enter into consultations if there is such a risk. On the other hand, we have uh, more and more what we call soft law. So that's non-binding law. It's a bit of a, a misnomer because you would say something is either law or it isn't. Uh, but there is non-binding law, which are guidelines, principles, codes of conduct, things like that. So different from a treaty, which do contain more and more uh, these uh, principles of uh, not leaving your satellite longer than necessary in orbit, of uh, trying to not interfere with your signals. Uh, many national laws oblige companies to remove their satellite or to reboost them to a graveyard orbit after the useful life. Uh, what do you feel the biggest soft spots are right now uh, with regard to space law and where are we most vulnerable? Well, I think here also, the, uh, again, the strategic importance of space is, uh, would come to mind and the risk of weaponization of outer space. You know, the first treaties were all based on the desire to keep outer space free of uh, military conflict. And we all know that space is being used for military purposes, uh, for surveillance, for spying, for uh, monitoring and so on. But so far we have avoided a weapons race. With the growing geopolitical tension here on Earth um, and, for instance, the creation of space forces in, in armies around the world, uh, the tension increases and that also means there is mistrust and that we need confidence-building measures and we need multilateral discussions and, and trust building. Uh, so I think that is uh, an important mission, uh, a soft spot, if you like to call it that. And uh, when it comes to crafting future space law, how do we upload the principle of the other space treaty that space exploration is open to everybody but avoid harmful interference? 
Yeah, that is the challenge because there are more and more actors. In the beginning, it was maybe relatively easy because there were only basically the two superpowers and then more states started to enter and now many more emerging spacefaring nations, as I said, plus all the space, the, the private actors, including universities, startups and, and established companies. And so all that uh, means that there can be conflict of interests. And one example is uh, the, the satellite constellations that I mentioned earlier. Uh, which are reflecting sunlight and are disturbing astronomy. So the uh, astronomers are optical astronomy as well as radio astronomy, by the way, are uh, suffering from interference from the small satellites that reflect the sunlight or that emit signals. So both of these are legitimate uses of outer space. The use of outer space is free, uh, but we have to somehow make sure that we balance both interests and that both can be used. So a lot of challenges to face in the sure. next year, for sure. sure. Thank you so much for this interesting conversation and for being here with me. Thank you.